As many of you probably know by now, I'm Dr. Noah Salto, um, and this morning I'll be giving the Eagle Talk on goodness. Uh, by way of introduction and to give you some context for my talk, um, I earned my bachelor's degree in German and comparative literature from the University of Georgia. I then spent a year at Eberhard Karls Universität in Tübingen, Germany, before I finished my master's degree in German at the University of Tennessee, where I also received my PhD in German and applied linguistics. Uh, at Carson Newman, I teach classes in linguistics, German, uh, I teach classes for the honors program, and I also direct the liberal arts program. When I'm not teaching, I write about the intersection of art, politics, and popular culture, and I serve as an editor for the Red Branch Review, which is a literary and visual art annual. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. So, when I first began my university studies, my dream was to be a writer and a translator. Uh, first, my parents, and then a series of supportive and encouraging teachers helped me begin to live a life of the mind and nurtured my love of literature and language and interest in other cultures. My freshman year of college, I took a class that centered on German-Jewish thinker and critic Walter Benjamin. One of the first texts we read, Critique of Violence, had a profound effect on me. Born out of the horror of war, pandemic, economic and political dysfunction in 1920s Germany, the text showed me how language and literature could be wielded both in service of oppression and for the purposes of propaganda and, uh, and oppression and authoritarianism and in service of freedom and justice to help us orient ourselves toward our common humanity or in terms we're perhaps more familiar with here at Carson Newman, what is true and beautiful and good. This course showed me something that I had only glimpsed before. Thinking, reading, and writing were matters of conscience, of compassion, and the public good. It convinced me to pursue the study of German and literature in college and then intensify those pursuits in graduate school, where I continued to return to the work of Walter Benjamin. His writing served as a touchstone that allowed me to explore several historically relevant eras of literature and art the 19th and early 20th centuries and the brewing crisis of modernity, the Weimar period, the aftermaths of the world wars, and the attendant reckoning with massive political, economic, and ideological forces, as well as man's inhumanity to man, uh, and the modern and postmodern periods where the echoes of fascism and revolution reverberate in art, literature, and politics. The tumult of Weimar Germany, a republic born in the waning days of World War I and killed when Hitler came to power, was the source of so much of the writing and thinking that continues to fascinate me. In the chaos of the era, the major concerns of public intellectual life returned to questions that have occupied searching minds for thousands of years. What is true? What is beautiful? What is good? Now, I don't expect you to be familiar with German intellectual and literary history but our own literary and philosophical tradition is full of meditations on goodness. Simply, our biblical, philosophical, and literary traditions all call us to do good. It is an activity. Like truth and beauty, goodness involves a pursuit. But goodness, historically, has been quieter, meeker, and perhaps in literature at least, less interesting than evil. Freedom, forgiveness, love, and kindness, after all, don't always make for compelling narrative conflict. Toni Morrison marks the contrast between good and evil in literature. She says that evil has a blockbuster audience. Goodness lurks backstage. Evil has vivid speech. Goodness bites its tongue. It is Billy Budd who can only stutter. It is Coutier's Michael Kay, with a hair lip that so limits his speech that communication with him is virtually impossible. It is Melville's Bartleby, confining language to repetition. It is Faulkner's Benji, an idiot. After the catastrophe of World War I, literature all but abandons goodness as an architectural concern for art, and it deteriorates from there. Many of the late 20th and early 21st century heavyweights Philip Roth, Norman Mailer, Saul Bellow, and so on, they are masters at exposing the frailty, the pointlessness, the comedy of goodness. And while explorations of goodness might not whet the appetite of every contemporary American reader, the canon is not without goodness as champions. C.S. Lewis, the English writer, literary critic, and Christian apologist, is rightly renowned for his intentional meditations on goodness in the figure of Aslan, possibly the most transparent symbol for Jesus in 20th century literature. 
But accompanying his fictional works, the Oxford tutor and later Cambridge professor insisted in essays and elsewhere that we, readers, citizens, people, should read widely and from various historical eras. His fellow inkling, J.R.R. Tolkien, was of similar mind. This depth and breadth of reading and study, this liberal arts education, accomplishes a twofold goal to show us that even the very wise and powerful can err, and then recognize and diagnose the blind spots of the, the of, and, sorry, <laughs> that recognizing and diagnosing the blind spots of the past might help us discover our own in the present. Both men wrote out of a deep understanding of the horror of war and a Christian and philosophical commitment to the celebration of humanity. This literary bridge built on the pillars of conscience and thirst for self-knowledge brings me to the person of Sophie Scholl, a figure with whom many Americans may not be acquainted. She was a student and daughter of pious middle-class Lutherans in the southern German city of Ulm in the late 1930s. Her prospects under the Nazi regime were not exceptionally bright, but she was intelligent and had a supportive social and intellectual circle. She and her brother Hans were enthusiastic members of Nazi youth organizations until over the course of several months, the Gestapo, the Nazis' secret police, arrested the whole family, parents and children, multiple times for questioning. This was in part because of their father Robert's political attitudes, but also as part of mass arrests for homosexual activity. The Scholl children were members of outlawed youth organizations, but the arrest also stemmed from the Nazis' simultaneous obsession with homoeroticism on the one hand and a total rejection of homosexuality on the other. In response to these repeated incursions into her personal life, and having been confronted with widespread corruption, criminality, and oppression, Sophie began to read seriously and searchingly. Her voracious reading continued while she endured service in the Reichsarbeitsdienst, the National Labor Service. Her dissatisfaction with the stiff hierarchy and mind-numbing routine caused her to find solace in her own spirituality and intellect guided by readings of St. Augustine, particularly his Confessions. Autobiographical and considered one of the great works of Western literature, Augustine's grappling with his own spiritual struggles, as well as his thirst for knowledge and wisdom, helped Sophie come to grips with her own circumstances. In her diaries, she notes that her soul was hungry. She yearned for autonomy and an end to the war. When she finally moved to Munich to study biology and philosophy in May 1942, her brother Hans, a medical student at the same university, and some of his friends had already begun to actively question the Nazi system. Serving as medics on the Eastern Front, they had seen the crimes against Jews and other civilians that the German army and the SS were committing in Poland and Russia. And they had seen the devastation wrought by the grim horror of combat on both their fellow Germans and the Russians. The German-American philosopher and political theorist Hannah Arendt would later help to define the legal term crime against humanity, using the atrocities perpetrated there by the Nazis and their collaborators as evidence. The Scholls knew that they couldn't remain quiet in the face of this evil and their fellow Germans' silence. Starting in June 1942, they began printing and distributing leaflets in and around Munich, calling their fellow students and the German public to action. Other members of their circle joined in the endeavor, writing four pamphlets until the fall of the same year. As a student, Sophie had seen the first flyers and applauded their content as well as their author's courage to speak truth to power. When she found out about her brother's involvement, she demanded to join the group. Her own conscience required that she no longer remain passive. The White Rose was the name of the group they formed to resist the regime. It was a small endeavor with long-lasting historical effect even if the vast majority of the members' contemporaries remained committed Nazis. The group and its lessons are more valuable to us, must be more valuable to us, than they were in their own time and place. At the core of the White Rose were siblings Hans and Sophie Scholl, their fellow students, Alexander Schmorel, Willi Graf, Christoph Probst, and a professor of philosophy and musicology at the University of Munich, Kurt Huber. Together, they published and distributed six pamphlets, first typed on a typewriter and multiplied via mimograph. 
At first, they only distributed them via mail, sending them to professors, booksellers, authors, friends, and others, going through phone books for addresses and handwriting each envelope. In the end, they distributed thousands, reaching households all over Germany. They went to great lengths to acquire enough paper, envelopes, and stamps at a time of strict rationing without raising suspicion. They succeeded by engaging a wide-ranging network of supporters in cities and towns as far north as Hamburg and as far south as Vienna. These networks were also activated to distribute the pamphlets, attempting to trick the Gestapo into believing the White Rose had locations all across Germany. The members of the White Rose were all killed by the Nazi regime, sentenced to death after a sham trial and intense interrogations when they were turned over to the secret police by a building superintendent who was an enthusiastic Nazi. The content of the leaflets they wrote, which, according to the Nazis, was dangerous propaganda, would invoke the swift and violent murder of the students. The danger to the Nazis, of course, was the truthful cataloging of their crimes and failures, moral, intellectual, and military. The first four leaflets, known collectively as the Leaflets of the White Rose, were March 1942 and July 1942, primarily by Hans Scholl and Alexander Schmorell, although the thoughts and voices of the other members can be read in the texts. In Leaflet 1, they seek to conjure up images of German classicist and cultural icon Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and the glorious Germany of days gone by in order to stir the consciences of those, the consciences of those living under National Socialism. They argue that failure to act against the regime will result in destruction and shame. In Leaflet 2, they poke fun at Hitler's bad German, his inability to think, speak, and write coherently, and delineate the crimes that are being committed by Germans in the name of National Socialism. In Alexander Schmorl's part of the leaflet, he declares Germans guilty, guilty, guilty if they do not act. In Leaflet 3, they develop the arguments for claiming that National Socialism is an evil regime. Probably the most famous of the first four leaflets, here they clearly define what passive resistance looks like and the everyday act of sabotage and resistance that could grind the war machine to a halt. Nonviolence, noncompliance, weaponized incompetence, subversion, sabotage, theft. The leaflet also especially angered the loyal National Socialists who read it for its insistence that Nazism was a greater evil than even the hated Bolshevism of the Soviets. In Leaflet 4, they narrowed their appeal to devout Lutherans, like the Scholl's mother, and religious Catholics, many of whom lived in Bavaria. Instead of quoting Goethe, Schiller, Aristotle, or Lao Tse as in earlier leaflets, they concentrated on Solomon's Proverbs and Novalis's strong Catholic imagery. This leaflet is most remembered for its insistence that the group were Germans independently advocating for an end to Nazism, not agents in the employ of a foreign power. It was also remembered for its ending, a chilling warning to capitulating Germans that we are your bad conscience. Leaflet 5 appeared after a six-month silence. Hans, Alex, and Sophie had taken counsel of more experienced propaganda writers by this time, specifically Falk Hanak, a member of the German resistance. This leaflet, call, call to all Germans, demonstrates greater maturity as a result. Uh, it's not nearly as verbose or poetic, strengthening its punch as propaganda. In the leaflet, they look beyond the end of the war and dream a new Europe without the stain of National Socialism. The sixth and final leaflet was written by Professor Kurt Huber. The language is elevated and engages in dialogue with the reader. He eloquently attempts to leverage German grief over their defeat at Stalingrad to stir anti-Nazi sentiment and he calls for a return to freedom. But while Huber's powerful exhortation to freedom as a committed nationalist and arch-conservative shows the White Rose's potentially broad appeal to his contemporaries, it falls flat for us because he intended those freedoms only for Aryans, the imaginary racial category that was the basis for Nazi justifications for the Holocaust. Now, I've already hinted at the end of this courageous act of resistance. This written campaign focused on the true and the good and the beautiful that the White Rose argued Germans had turned away from and the pervasive, dumb, and empty evil they had instead embraced. On February 18th, 1943, Hans and Sophie Scholl were caught distributing the sixth pamphlet in the main lecture hall of Munich University. Investigations led the Gestapo to other members of the movement, 
Hobst and the Scholes were subjected to a hasty show trial before the so-called People's Court, an arm of the Nazi party, on February 24th. They were executed on the same day. Graf, Huber, and Schmorl were tried and executed in the subsequent months. The Nazi newspaper Volkische Beobachter justified the executions as punishment for spreading defeatist ideas. Three days after the first executions, Nazi student leaders held speeches in the Munich University Auditorium, where hundreds of students jeered and stamped their feet with outstretched arms in the Nazi salute. That weighty, dark reality is perhaps lifted and lightened by the fact that we're talking today about Sophie Scholl, not the nameless Nazis who reveled in her execution. I think that is in part because of her commitment to the true, the beautiful, and the good. We have the great fortune and intellectual luxury of Sophie's private correspondence. In it, she frames the moral stakes, the necessity of conscience, in confronting social and political evils. After all, she writes, one should have the courage to believe in what is good. I do not mean that one should believe in illusions, but I mean that one should do only what is true and good and take it for granted that other people will do the same in a way that one can never do with the intellect alone. That is, that is to say, never calculate. The task of the White Rose was to rouse the consciences of people who had slipped into apathy and illusion. The leaflets referenced the intellectual titans and idols of the German middle class, Aristotle, Goethe, Schiller. They are the perfect conduit for these students in search of truth and beauty and, yes, goodness, to reach their parents, their teachers, their pastors, all those people with their fingers balanced on the lev levers of power. The philosophers and classical German writers were seen as traditional, culturally foundational, but also valuable as resistant and resistance to fascism. Now, Aristotle had plenty to say about the purpose and function of the state, but he also thought seriously about what it meant to lead a good life. And his lessons begin, first and foremost, with an exhortation. Name your fears and face them. He advocates that we focus on the transcendent, the true, the beautiful, and the good, rather than on what is trivial. And importantly, to clearly define a, mor a morality and then live up to it, even in private. The White Rose leveraged the image and writings of Goethe to remind Germans about the goals of morality, the nation, the life of the mind. Along with the graffiti they scrawled on walls in Munich, calling for freedom and the downfall of the Nazi state, their first pamphlet contains a quote from Goethe's Awakening of Epimenides, translated here for you. Spirits, that which has arisen bravely from the pit can conquer half the globe with a pitiless destiny, but return it must to the abyss. Monstrous fears are threatening now. In vain will he resist, and all those who cling to him will follow him to ruin. Hope, now I meet my good men who have gathered in the night to keep silence, not to sleep. The lovely word of freedom is spoken, lisping and stammering, until in unaccustomed newness, we stand upon our temple steps and cry a new and raptured freedom. The graffiti and Goethe, hand in hand. The White Rose's third pamphlet, like the rest, begins with a punchy slogan that served as its title. But this one is the most germane to our topic this morning. If you know, why don't you act? The White Rose called Germans to do what is right, not through the exercise of absolute power, but through their own moral faculties, the expression of conscience. If you know, why don't you act? The group drew on scripture, theologians like St. Augustine and John Henry Newman, and writers like Goethe, Dostoevsky, and Novalis, all who demand of humanity the development and maintenance of conscience and action driven by it in the pursuit of human freedom and fulfillment, doing, in other words, what is good? The Scholes, as I said, were voracious readers and clearly understood the power of language, the change it could make, and the good it could do. Sophie loved verse, and the short, beautiful, and tragic art arc of the group's good deeds is served, in turn, by poetry. For Sophie, now that you know, what will you do? You will leave town and send back the truth. 
You will collect paper and marginalia. You will buy knowledge and the means to share it in secret, in danger, inexorably. You will plan, conspire, compose, smuggle, deposit, and in a moment of panic, bravery, joy, foolishness, defiance, the truth will flutter white rose petals through the atrium of a university, which will lead to a jail cell, a confession that cannot save your friends and family, and in a moment, a conviction, a sentencing, an execution, your head cut off for what you know, the truth from your throat now cut, that we are good, must be good, that we are more than we care to admit, that evil is easy and safe and boring, that goodness is a whisper, rustling paper, a pen stroke in the dark, a thread impossibly thin that binds us to each other, a head held high before the guillotine. Now that you know, what will you do? The white rose was plucked. Germans, by and large, ignored the group's idealist calls to conscience. The Holocaust continued its grim unfolding for two more years. But as I've said, reading with Sophie and Hans provides us, in a different time and place, with a cornucopia of meaningful pursuits and vital insights. Where can we practice goodness? We do not, after all, live in Nazi Germany. But the answer is simple, here. We have a fleeting, wonderful, urgent opportunity here at Carson Newman to be truly radical, to think about a world where art, real peace, not the absence of war, and real love for strangers, for the poor, for the oppressed, the outcast, the imprisoned, and for ourselves in our humanity are possible. We're thinking seriously about and worth striving for. Now that you know, what will you do?